Michael, come on, yeah. man. Come on, man. I know you've been watching all that soccer going on at the Euros and you're tired and it's midnight back there, but we got a chance to have a couple of real special people on the show. Uh, Phoebe Schechter, ex-Buffalo Bill tight end coach, who's now coaching in Germany, in the semi-professional league in Germany, in the GFL, is going to come back and weigh in on a couple things and talk about, uh, you know, her experiences in uh, Buffalo and and her experiences with Cole Beasley and her experiences in Germany. It will be a fun, fun conversation. She's a great, great coach and a great, great person. And one of my guys is going to come join us from the desert. And that's why we got to do this so late at night. But Chris Banjo, safety, nine-year NFL veteran for the Arizona Cardinals, is going to come and chop it up with us today. Yes, sir. And I have to say, and for anybody watching this, this interview coming up now with Chris is – it's fantastic. It doesn't matter what team you support in the NFL. Very good journey, very good interview. But before we do that, Jeff, it's coming home, yeah? No? What's uh, coming home? What's coming home? Well, apparently football is, if you're English, everyone's uh, talking about I, You know, that's a little tough for you to say, isn't it? Huh? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, we're, not we're, don't, don't, we're, don't, we're no, wait, 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 no. That's, that's tough. You were, admit you were rooting for Germany. No, 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 no. It's, Cut it's it out. It's you all were good. Not, it's all good. You, you get thrown out of Ireland if you. you I support a Premier League. To, I, I support a Premier League football soccer team, so I can't sit here and say. Who's it. who's got now? My French screwed it up, right? Wait, they, wait, wait. La Blue was La Bad, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's going to win this thing? Well, this is it. This is going out in the Thursday night, so it all starts tomorrow night again. It's it's England's to lose. However, I am going to London next week, so if Neil Reynolds does want to meet up and have a beer or two, uh, there you go. This is moment. There you, there you but, go. There you go. Yeah, no man. It's 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 funny. Like you, you keep me up. It's what one a.m. here, but I think it was definitely worth it for Mr. Bonjo's interview. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And I think I hope you fans enjoy it. So let's get right to it. Bring on Chris Banjo. This is now episode fifty-six. Man. Oh. Coffee with the coach, and we are exceptionally pleased to bring you one of the all-time greats. Ever to come out of the fighting city of Kempner, not really, but <laughs> ever to come out of Kempner High School and a guy that I met, I think you were probably 17 years old when I met you for the first time. That sounds about right. I, I, I'm pretty sure I had hair too. So <laughs> it's just been a little bit of time. Little and little you, you had a little a little more hair and a little less money than you got now after <laughs> nine years in the National Definitely Football League. Far, yeah, far less money for sure. Chris Banjo joins us today, and Chris, as you Cardinal fans all know, is the safety for uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Had a good run of years in New Orleans and a good run of years in Green Bay. Was the special teams captain in Green Bay. Served that same role in New Orleans and is now in on his third NFL team in his ninth year in the National Football League. And it has been an amazing journey for you, Chris. Uh, like I said, you know, from when I first met you, when I'm at the University of Hawaii, and you're a you're a young safety with uh, a pretty good safety playing right next to you too, correct? Yeah, he was all right. He was all right. <laughs> now, the guy that we're talking about is Georgia Loca, and you Cincinnati Bengal fans will certainly remember George. He was a key part of that real good defense they had a couple of years ago, and they won a won the division. Now, what's going on with him? Is what's the latest on George? Man, George has been battling. Man, he's uh, unfortunately, as, I can't remember exactly when it was last season. Um, he had an ACL uh, done uh, in the, in, I want to say in practice. So uh, he's been busting his tail trying to recover and get back. And by God's grace, he literally just got cleared. I want to say maybe two or three days ago. So he's he's back already. He's he's looking good, and he's a. Uh, by God's grace, waiting for his next opportunity. And, and, and until then, he's, he's busting his tail, trying to get back to you know where he was and even better. So, Chris, I, I meet you in 2007, and I'm at the University of Hawaii. You're at Kempner High School. I start to recruit you. You make a commitment to come to the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the world changes for everybody, right? <laughs> June Jones gets, uh, you know, Actually, it, it's an amazing story. Eric Dickerson, who had played at SMU and played for June in the NFL, said, hey, you, June, you got to come to Dallas and save my school, save the football program at SMU, because they had been horrible for a long time. And so 
I remember when we made, when June made the decision that we were going to leave, you had already committed Hawaii. And so I remember that call where I said, Hey, uh, Chris, uh, <laughs> 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 we said, how do you like Dallas? And, and we were really, really fortunate that you, that you uh, chose to come to SMU and you had a great career on the Hilltop starting since your first game, correct? Uh, well, I played my first game. I think it was about maybe the fifth or sixth game where I officially took over as a starter. Um, but I was definitely, ever since I got there, I was definitely active uh, from jump and got tossed right in the fire, right in the mix and, and learned a lot on the fly. So, but it, it's crazy how it all worked out for sure. Yeah, it is because I can remember my, my most vivid memory of you early on in your SMU career was we go to play the second year, we're one and eleven. The first year, and yeah. you know, we had a bunch of Cole Beasley was starting at wide. We had a bunch of freshmen playing for us because yeah. we knew we had good players. They just needed to learn how to play. Mm. And the second year, we win seven, and we go to the Hawaii Bowl to play Colin Kaepernick and the Nevada yeah. Wolfpack. And of all thirty bowl teams that that year, <laughs> all thirty bowl <laughs> games that year, we yeah. were the biggest underdog of anybody. In the bowl season. I think it was like 90 something percent, 99, 98 something percent of people expected us to lose or whatever the case may have been. So, and I remember after we beat Kaepernick and Reno, you standing on the bench yep. with that big, with that big sign that's, that said just that 97% of America yep. said we'd lose and we, and we won and we won our eighth game and, and it and we took beat off. The breaks off too. We didn't just win. We beat the breaks off of them too. So. Just in case people forgot, I had to make sure I, you know I put that the board up there. Now SMU is a school that has had a tremendous run in the '80s when Dickerson and James and Jerry Ball and all that crew was there. Uh, they've also had some good runs over the course of time uh, when Hayden Fry was the head coach there, when when Bum Phillips coached at SMU. But one of SMU's claims to fame is the first school in the old Southwest conference that scholarship an African-American player. And that, that player is a legendary player that went on and played with the San Diego chargers and the Houston Oilers, Jerry Levias. And Chris, I want you to tell the listeners why that's significant in your life. Man, Jerry Levias, that, that name alone, it, it does something to me. Um, Thanks to, I would say, you and, and Coach Jones and everybody on the staff, what you guys were able to do uh, and symbolize through him meant a lot. Um, and, and that's in bringing the Jerry Levias Award uh, to SMU. And for me to be the first recipient of that award, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, there's no way back then I really, really understood everything that went into that. I Even still now, I still can't. You know, because I, I didn't come up in the area he did. I didn't go through the things that he went through. But to be able to uh, converse with him and see the type of guy he is and what he stands for, uh, what he exemplifies is, is tremendous. So for you guys to to see maybe a little bit of that, even uh, an inkling of that in me, uh, it meant the world. Uh, like I said, everything that he went through and everything he, he, he symbolized and stood for uh, was tremendous. You know, for, for as great an athlete as you are and it, it, you know, nine years in the National Football League and all you've done, you're still the one of the most humble guys I've ever met. Right? <laughs> and so I'm going to tell the story without embellishment about <laughs> that award, the Jerry Levias Award. And what we decided was June and I were talking and we, we felt like it was important that we honored Jerry in some way. And not only honored Jerry, but honored everything that Jer Jerry stood for. Jerry was an outstanding student at SMU. He was an outstanding person at SMU. He was an outstanding player at SMU. So we said, whoever is that guy on our football team each year is bestowed the honor of wearing Jerry's number 23 in his career. And yes, you know, we really felt like it was important to make it a living number, not a, not, you know, not a number up on the side of the, uh, you know, the stadium. No and, doubt. And Chris, you are the only guy who has who has won that three straight years, and I yes, think sir. that is an unbelievable accomplishment. And uh, you know, I, I just as you say, because it, it's you are exactly what that award stands for. 
No, it, it was a blessing and honor to wear it. Like, not just once, but three times. 23, even when I see it now, that, that still, you know, sticks very, very closely to me for sure. Um, so I'm definitely always going to be grateful for that award for sure. All right, now, you finish your career at SMU. You guys are responsible for turning a team that hadn't been to a bowl game in over 30 years to you were in your four years at SMU. You were in three of them and mm -hmm. uh, played extremely well. Weren't drafted. And no, you can you take us now through what you went through between the day, the last day of the draft, and when you first got the opportunity to be a National Football League player? Man, it's crazy that that is nine years ago, I guess. Um, boom, every it's, it's coming up. You know, you have pro days, you have com all the things that, you know, people go through pre-draft. Wasn't a combine guy, that's fine. Uh, pro day, I thought I did pretty well, at least well enough to combine, to, uh, combine that with my college uh, career to at least get an opportunity, whether that I got drafted late, uh, whether I was undrafted, and like you said, I was neither of those. So I had a, for people who don't know I work, sometimes when you're not drafted, you'll sometimes at least get a trial. So I had two mini camp trials, one with the Steelers and one with the Raiders. At the time, I'm like, oh, this is it. This is my first NFL experience opportunity. Little did I know, though, that was nothing close to it. I was really, <laughs> I was just a body to get through rookie mini camp, you know. Um, and in hindsight, I'm, again, I'm so thankful for it because every step of the way, every sign or every opportunity I got was like another little breadcrumb for to allow me to continue to try to pursue my dream. Um, but I want to say that ended in like maybe, maybe, ah, I can't remember, maybe sometime in May, June, somewhere around there. But the whole time I'm still continuing trying to work out, trying to work out. Um, and it comes, it comes time to where it's like, no, I, I have to support myself. You know, you can't, you know, I graduated college. I'm no longer on scholarship. Uh, most people graduate, they enter the workforce. Um, so that gap, I then had to get a job. Uh, I was a corporate, I, was, I had a corporate job and I was a technical, as a technical recruiter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with what recruiters do. Uh, but I was doing it in the tech uh, in the tech industry, something I had no clue how I even found that. <laughs> but I'm like, I, like I got, I had bills to pay, I had people to support, I had things I had to do, so uh, I, I just had to figure something out. Uh, so in the midst of that, I would wait, but I, I still wanted to obviously achieve my dream. So in the midst of that, I would wake up. I want to say four, four thirty. Uh, you know, make my breakfast, whatever the case may have been, so I can get to the gym about five fifteen, five thirty and get a workout in before work, you know, you're working a, a eight to five. There's not many hours, I guess you could say for yourself, especially if you're still trying to pursue the NFL. Um, so I, I had to get up early to do that. And, you know, once work was over at five, go sit in traffic for about 30, 45 minutes and go hit the field and do it again. Uh, so I did that all the way from, I want to say late July, early August, maybe up in to the next go round with the whole NFL, with the, you know, the combines and the pro days and everything like that. Um, and it, it, it was hard. It was tough. It was tough to see, you know, not that you want to see guys get hurt, but you would see guys get hurt and you would see other guys get opportunities that you felt like should have been yours. Um, but by God's grace, I was able to stay strong and, and stay motivated. Um, so I, again, I did that for a whole year. Uh, pro day comes around. I, I, you guys let me participate in pro day again, which I'm very thankful for. Um, again, I'm training for it this whole time. Like, you know, my opportunity is going to come. I get to pro day and the scouts are like, Hey, we saw you last year. We don't need to see you anymore. So I, I don't know what to do. And that split second, I, I have no clue what to do, why I'm even here, what's going on. But obviously guys that I played with are, are, are competing, trying to go to pro day or trying to uh, go to the NFL. So I'm like, you know what? Let me stay and watch. You know, let me support my guys. Let me, you know, partake in it that way. Um, then a guy by the name of Alonzo Highsmith, who I'm still grateful for and thankful for to this day. At that time, he had been elevated in terms of he was now the big dog in terms of like, you know, being in the front office and whatnot. So he walks out the tunnel. He was like, "What you know? What you still doing chasing his dream and this that, and the third? And I just told him, "Hey, you know, I got to put it to bed first, you know." And he was like, if I let you run a 40, you're going to embarrass me. I was like, the only way you can find out is if you let me do it. So <laughs> he, he tells all the other guys, he's like, hey, this guy's going to run a 40. And they're like, OK, you know, that's he's now the OG now. He's a big dog now, you know. So he's like, OK, uh, let him do it. And um, I go out there and run a 
And then all of a sudden now, you know, I'm the pretty girl on campus to a certain extent, you know, <laughs> people, are interested, you know, people want to, you know, Hey, what's your contact info? Hey, like, like they, you know, never, like they didn't just see me a year before. Uh, and that's why I always say God works in mysterious ways. Cause Alonzo is kind of always known about me just from the simple fact that I used to play against his son in high school mm-hmm. when he was at high time. So mm-hmm. to have that small connection in that specific point in time is amazing, you know, and, and ever since then I had an opportunity and I, I've done my best to not look back since. So, so when you get to Green Bay, right? Yeah. After I got cut in Jacksonville, yeah. After you get cut in Jacksonville, which the is now day the, before, the, the day before th- training, the third team you've been with, and you haven't even been to a training camp yet, right? Yep. But this is the third team you've been with. Now you go to Green Bay. At yep. any point in that time, you know, three rejection letters. Right. A whole year between when you finished and the camp that you never got to in Jacksonville. Was there ever a time in that, Chris, where you just said, man, I got to get I got to get real with my life and move on? It's to say this out loud now is crazy to me to say, but not for a split second. Did I ever think about anything else but the opportunity I had at the moment? And. Now knowing the, the the odds and percentages of how hard it is for, I guess you could say street guys like me to come in late, come in late into camp and not only come in and, and play, but make the team, make the 53. There's, there's no way in hell you would have me bet money on somebody to do that just because of what I've seen. Like I've, I've been fortunate enough to see how the NFL works to a certain extent, but to go back and rewind and put myself in that mindset that I was in, not for a split second did I think about not playing football. Like, I'm like, I'm here and I have to make this work. There was no other alternative for me at the time. You know, at least I didn't feel like there was. So See, that sense of determination, that commitment to your vision, all of those things that we talk about was so true of so many of you guys at SMU at that time. I mean, I look around and and there's Emmanuel still playing. There's Cole Beasley still playing. And and it, and, those two guys are exactly the same way. Like you can't no, no. like Emmanuel didn't believe ever that anybody could cover him. And Cole still doesn't believe anybody. Still could don't. Cover him. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no. so now you get, let's talk about the green Bay experience that cause that was the real first team that you made. Mm-hmm. How, 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 like you, you, you're like, you say, you're a guy that's been out, out for a year, right? Mm-hmm. You've been cut three times. Mm-hmm. And now you roll up into Green Bay and make the squad. Well, yeah. What ha- what happened? They have the flu up there and everybody got sick I mean, or what? So, so things just got to work out for you. I don't know. And that's, again, that's why I always say this has nothing to do with me. I just show up when I can and do the most that I can and, and leave the rest of God. But I remember showing up, um, again, four days late in the training camp. Uh, Green Bay was a great place. When I got off the plane. In training camp, most people think muggy, hot, you know, just, just just brutal conditions to, to practice in. I got to training camp. I got off the plane, and I want to say it was like 68 degrees or something. This is August. I'm like, where? I was like, where am I? You know what I mean? First off, off that alone, I was excited because I'm like, if this is what we're practicing in, this is going to be real good for me. You don't have to worry about the elements or anything like that. Um, we, I want to say the f- first day, my first day, I had to be in pads because everybody else was in pads. I don't think I had an affirmation. I can't remember. But I remember we did a tackling drill and <laughs> we did a tackling drill. It was on a pad. It was just on a pad. But I ran through that pad <laughs> in a way that I've never hit anything or anybody before. I had a whole year's worth of sitting on the couch built up in me. And I remember Coach Mike had put it on the um, had put it on the on the in the team meeting, he had put it on the screen in the team, in the team meeting and talked about how hungry I was and how everybody needs to match that. And again, this is, I'm a random guy coming off the street, you know, you talk um, about coach Mike, you talk about coach McCarthy in coach, front of the yes, team. Coach McCarthy. Yes, sir. He was, he was, a, he was coaching uh, the Packers at the time. Um, and he was talking about, he was talking about how people need to match that, you know? Um, and sure enough, I just continued to just, I try to take a day at a time, stack days, stack days. Uh, and there was another day I had Aaron Rodgers come say, I'm like, this, this is me trying my best not to be, a, a groupie in any type of way, shape, or form. <laughs> I, I, I'll say it. You know, I'm coming from Jacksonville. Again, this is no disrespect to anybody who plays in the league, but 
there's not a lot of star power at the time when I met, when I was at Jacksonville. I mean, Jacksonville was still one of the worst teams in the league. And at the time I got cut, I'm like, I just got cut from Jacksonville. Like, where who's gonna you know pick me up then? And I'm able, fortunate enough to go to Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, Clay Matthews, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, like big time stars. And I remember Aaron coming up to me and said, you know, hey, you're you're looking good. I remember talking talking to my brother Jordan about you, who was in Jacksonville with me at the time. So I'm like, Aaron Rodgers had a conversation about me, you know. I'm, I'm, okay, you know, I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm like, I'm a, like, you know, get back to it, you know. Uh, but the, the experience I had in Green Bay was tremendous to to go through everything I was fortunate enough to go through, um, and still make the team with certain things just lining up right. I remember we had a guy who was kind of a starter who was kind of battling with somewhat of an injury, so they kind of limited him, limited him a little bit in preseason. So that elevated some of the other guys behind them to be able to get on the field. Um, and I've always taken pride in me learning my playbook and, and, and knowing what to do. Uh, and that helped me elevate myself past some other guys who were on the roster. And the time came, I was able to play in the first dime package against Russell Wilson in the preseason. And I looked like I belong and I did my thing on special teams and I never looked back. So, um, yeah. Okay. Now, you know, Special teams were so key to you making that team, right? No doubt. And, it is. and, and I know I know Coach Zook it was just like you were like his model citizen. Like you were <laughs> he you were his guy. And one of the most proud moments I've ever had in broadcasting was broadcasting a game where you go out as the special teams captain for the mm-hmm. coin toss in a national football league game. And I yeah. think and and I'm thinking to myself. Boy, that ain't that skinny little kid, that 17-year-old <laughs> kid from Kempner High School anymore. No, no. Now, t- tell me your best special team story about when you were in Green Bay. Man, honestly, you hit it, you hit it right on the head in terms of me being elected captain. Um, the reason to me that resonates so heavily with me is the fact I, I know most teams, if I'm not mistaken, they they select their captains before the season starts, right after the last preseason game, going into the season. Uh, whether it's coach led, whether from my understanding, a lot of places are player led, you know, players elect who they want, you know, to be the captain. And the only thing about that, which I still think obviously is a great thing to do, but the thing that's different about that is that you have a lot of younger guys who don't necessarily know maybe who should be a leader or who is or who isn't or whatever the case may be, but they're going off of maybe just names that they may have known from that team the year before, whatever the case may have been. The thing that was different for us in Green Bay at the time is that we selected captains once we got to the playoffs, once we, we uh, yeah, once we were heading to the playoffs, one, it set a standard of like, we have to get to the playoffs first, which was great. But two, it let, I think, players really grasp a different sense of respect for pl- other players as the season went on. You know what I mean? Who they really, by the time you ended up voting uh, as a player, you, f- you felt like you were really voting for somebody you f- really felt like deserved this, you know, this honor, th- that uh, opportunity. To, to be a captain, whether it was offense, defense, or special teams. So to be selected captain at the end of a season, um, going into the playoffs, that that was extremely humbling. That was extremely humbling. That was a, a, a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous blessing to to be selected by my, you know, my peers as a captain. Um, so, it, man, I, I'll never take that, that part for granted for sure. All right. All right, man. Then give me this one now. All right. It's the playoffs. Yep. Playoffs, playoffs. <laughs> it's the playoffs, yep. right? It's Green Bay. It's cold. It's snowing, okay. yep. and you're you're coming out of the tunnel at the frozen tundra of <laughs> Lambeau Field. Yeah, yeah. Did you even hit the ground? I mean, like, did your spikes even touch the ground? Not at all. This, this, like you just said, it's playoffs, man. In Green Bay, and I've been fortunate again to play in numerous stadiums experience different atmospheres but we're talking about green bay man this is green <laughs> bay. you know what i mean in, in playoff playoff football you know like it, it doesn't get any better than that really you know to to battle the elements to, to battle another team with the guys that you've been grinding with man you can't you can't you can't make this up man you can't even really put into words that type of experience especially as a younger guy in the league you know so um I, those are days I'll definitely never forget for sure. All right, so it's it's from the Packers. Mm-hmm. You go straight south down the Mississippi River. 
<laughs> and then and end up in New Orleans. And not yep. only do you end up in New Orleans, but you end up with, I think there were five SMU guys yeah. in New Orleans with you. Five yep. guys that you played with were at were in the at on that those really, really good Saints teams. Yep. Now you, I don't know if you realize this, but you in a lot of ways changed some things about pump protection in the NFL. Because you were one of the first really fast fullbacks mm-hmm. ever in, 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 in the NFL. Usually that was a bigger guy, a linebacker, a tight end, one of those kinds of guys. And all what of up? a sudden, how big are you now, Chris? I mean, what do you weigh uh, today? Like, what would you get on the right, weight? On? As we speak, probably like 203, 204. Okay, so you're six feet, 203. <laughs> Right, six feet, man. I, if I was six feet, I, I'm like trying to. I'm trying to treat you right here. <laughs> I appreciate. I appreciate it, coach. I, I see. That's why I always mess with you. I appreciate it. All right. So, anyway, you you you're not the you don't you don't fit the mold of that guy, no, right? No, 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 because no. I mean, that's the guy's got to handle the you know the wraparound from the from the a gap. The, they might mm-hmm. block a defensive lineman, and you did such a good job with it. A number of teams started to go to that smaller fullback, the guy that could get out. If, if it was double vice on the outside and forced the fair catch from fullback. So I got to tell you that as a special teams coach, I, I really appreciate that part of your game. What was New Orleans like when you go? I mean, you, you've had some quarterbacks, man. Right? No doubt. Think about that. You've had some Aaron Rodgers and then, oh, just that other guy from Purdue at in New Orleans, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, and people always try to ask me, is Aaron, is it Drew? Is it, and I, I really can't. I really can't give an answer because there's different ways to skin a cat. And if you just follow both of their careers, it, they're both tremendous. I mean, Aaron, I'll stay on this to the day I'm gone. Like Aaron to me is, is the best physical specimen. And from an arm perspective as a, uh, in a quarterback, as in a quarterback that the league has ever seen and will ever see. I know everybody's on Patrick Mahomes and don't get me wrong. He's, I want to say one B if that, but, the no look passes, that all that everybody sees now. He was been, doing that. He was doing that every been, day. Been doing that. Practice, what whatever you want to call it. You know, maybe social media wasn't up as much, or you know, the camera. I don't know. But Aaron, from a raw talent perspective, is unmatched. But then you go to Drew, from a preparation perspective, is unmatched. I've never seen anybody work as hard as he does, prepare as hard as he does, and, and to have a guy like that leading your team. So. I got the best of both worlds, honestly. And it was a blessing to be able to play with both of those guys. All right. I got to tell you the story and you will appreciate this. We're, we win the conference. We're undefeated. We're going to sugar bowl to play Georgia. We're using the saints facility to work out. This is Mm -hmm. when you were still in high school, your senior in high school. And our entire team has to wait 15 minutes on the side, on the (laughs) sideline because Drew Brees is out there by himself and yep. two or three practice roster receivers, not even regular guys, it right? is, yep. just practice. Right. And he's out there throwing. I mean, the guy's a ma- machine. Yeah. Because you talk about a guy's not very tall. Like I was shocked, Chris, when we walked out on, a, on the field and how, how he is, he, he's, if he's 5'11", I, I don't best, believe it. At best. <laughs> so, so now you get a chance to go to the desert. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, ex- talk me through that transition in your career. Now, to me, this is is very different. Uh, like you said, I went from Green Bay, from Aaron Rodgers. Then I go to New Orleans, to Drew Brees. I won't say they're old quarterbacks, but they're definitely they're older than me. They came up in a different area. Now I go. Now I go to Arizona, the desert where you have Kyler Murray. Again, one of the best talents, raw talents that you'll see. Um, but I'm used to my quarterbacks. Aaron had one of the older helmets. Drew had one of the older helmets, the way they prep. The way they, but then I'm going down to Arizona. My quarterback is wearing a visor. You know what I mean? He got, some <laughs> he, you he know, got, some, he got some swag going. You know, it's, it's just, it, was, it was real different for me. You know what I mean? I, this, I didn't get to Arizona until my, I want to say my seventh year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, my seventh season. So there was already a certain standard that I was used to and accustomed to. And I'm like, man, I, I, so it was something that was different for me, but it was cool to see that, you know, a guy like that can still win you games for sure. It doesn't have to look a certain way. And that's why I said there's so many different ways to skin a cat. So in Arizona, to me also, it, it was, it's, a, it's been a cool experience so far. 
because it's somewhat reminiscent to SMU. When I got to Green Bay, Green Bay was already good. But they, they had been good. They won a Super Bowl. Same thing similar to New Orleans. Um, Arizona, even though they've had good years in the past couple of years before, it has continued to be continued to rebuild. So to be able to partake in that, and my first year, I can't remember how many games we won, but I know we were better the following season. So but slowly but surely, having the opportunity to be on the team that's rebuilding, continuing to get better, and that's ascending, uh, that's that's been a blessing to have that type of opportunity, and I, and I and I take pride in it for sure. Uh, I'm trying to make the most of it. You know what, Vance Joseph, your defensive coordinator, once mm-hmm. played for me. So please tell him. Please. No, tell him I didn't. Know. Yeah, okay. yeah. Vance was a was a corner for me in NFL Europe, and okay. uh, please please tell him I said hello. I definitely will. Now you guys are defensively have really done some good things in the last year. That defense has come a long, long way. You've drafted well, Chris. What's the what's the next step? Now you got TJ Watt in there to take some of the pressure off Chandler Jones. What's the next step for the your defense in Arizona? I think just everybody getting there and playing together, hitting the ground, running. We know what we're capable of doing. We know the guys that we have there. Uh, just hitting the ground running, starting fast. Uh, I feel like if you turn on the film from last year and you just see some of the things we did. In, in, in certain spurts, we were for sure the best defense in the league. We're definitely capable of doing that. I believe so. Um, but we just have to continue to be disciplined and continue to build. Um, God willing, we, we have a, a unit that everybody's able to stay healthy. And, you know, that's just the NFL. You, if everybody could say that, you know, <laughs> where would everybody be? But um, if we can hit the ground running, I believe, uh, and guys continue to gel together, grow together, um, I think our defense is going to be a, a really, really, really hard one to – to compete against, you know, and that's all we're looking for, you know, so. All right, I'm, I'm going to give you some names, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to play word association game. I'm going <laughs> to give you some names and you can, you can, you no more than a sentence. I'll give you a sentence. Gotcha. But I want you, I want I want a synopsis of that person, that guy, when right. I give you that name. And I'm going to start with this one. I'm going to go in the OG category and I'm going to say Larry Fitzgerald. Go, go. Head to toe, everything about him. Go. All right. Let's go, JJ Watt. Captain America. I, I love I love Marvel, by the way. I love I love you know superheroes and all that. So I probably will use those things a, a couple of times as we go, but for sure, Captain America. Uh just the way he prepares so far. I, I've only been with him my offseason, but you could tell. The way he, he takes care of his body, how attentive he is to everything, the way he leads. And you could you could definitely tell he has that inspirational trait to him. So it's been cool to be around him so far. D hop. Man, D hop. I don't I don't even know how to describe D hop. That, that, <laughs> man, D hop is one of the most interesting players I've seen in my whole entire in my whole entire life that I've come across. One of the most chill people you'll ever meet. Um and just different, different, like. Bro, I got to ask you, because. He's a bad like, man. Like, he's a bad I, man. I, I, does a guy, does a guy have a pulse? Because I. No, like, that's what I'm saying. It feels like he does, like, he, nothing's ever too big. It, it, no, There's no moment that's ever too big for him to, you know what I'm saying, to, to step on the field and, and wow you. You know what I mean? Like, and he'll look at you like, why are you surprised? You know what I mean? And it's almost getting to the point, really, with me that I'm not anymore, so. Like, I think at the time where he caught that Hail Mary for us last year, in the moment, obviously, I was definitely, you know what I'm saying, starstruck with what happened. But when you really realize who it is, I, I, it makes perfect sense. You know what I mean? So D-Hop is definitely different. And when I say different in the fact that, like, that, that's kind of what the new kids are saying now, different. You know, my teammates keep me young. Different. <laughs> somebody say, hey, that guy's different. These younger guys know what we're talking about when we say that. All right, let, let's talk about another different guy, if you want to use it, yeah. that, that kind of terminology. Isaiah Simmons. That's a freak, a freak athlete. Freak athlete. Like, I, I, I saw everything, you know, everybody saw his combine prep and everything that everybody talked about or whatnot. And, but to, able, to be able to see it in person is a whole nother different animal. To see how fluid he runs and, and how well he changes direction and everything that comes with it, it it's crazy. And by God's grace, once he's able to put all of that together, now, you know, this is his second year going into it, he's going to be a problem for sure. There's no I, doubt about it. 
now that's a that's fascinating to me because mm-hmm. when you're a nine year NFL veteran, you've seen a lot of guys, and you've seen no a doubt. lot of guys that are great athletes and great players. No doubt. But but when you say when you describe him the way you describe him, he's got to be different. Like he's no, got to be a freak. Linebackers are not supposed to be able to run like that. Just plain and simple, they're not supposed to be able to run like that. I I know the game is different now. Maybe that's maybe they are supposed to be able to run like that. I must have missed that memo. But for him to <laughs> For him to be built the way he is and to move the way he is is extremely impressive. I've never seen in my in my career where you can confidently match up your inside linebacker on a slot receiver and expect him to win. You know, so <laughs> that that concept alone is crazy. You know, so it, it's been fun to see. Cliff Kingsbury. Coolest. <coughs> I apologize. Coolest man, bro. Cool, cooler than the other side of the pillow. Thank <laughs> that every time if he if if Cliff I, I can't I can't I don't even know if I've ever seen Cliff mad. Obviously you've seen him intense and and, and, and seen him passionate about something, but I feel like he he's not he doesn't you know get too far off of that line. Like he's calm, cool, and collected uh every step of the way. So just to, to have a coach that has that type of confidence, I feel like it gives you confidence in what you're doing, you know. So um to me, Cliff, I always say cool Cliff. Like I say, cool on the other side of the pillow for sure. Is he you ever does he like ever bring you up to the crib? Because that that man when man, when, when, when they did been, the, when, when they did the draft from that place, I was like, come on, Cliff. Man, look, we've all been trying to, and he said it was Airbnb. I'm like, man, I don't believe that, coach. You ain't, <laughs> you ain't fooling me. <laughs> I'm too old for that. You're not fooling me. But not nah, Cliff. Cliff is a cool guy for sure. All right, how many can the Cardinals get next year? And don't tell me sixteen. But I want I. I <laughs> I gotta it's know. Seventeen now. Can, it's seventeen. I, don't tell me seventeen because I don't want your cliche. I want how you really feel. What are you guys capable of in the desert next year? Man, I I've always stayed away from this question just because you never know what it gets turned into. But I, honestly, I'll just say this: I, I feel like we're capable of something special for sure. I feel like I don't know the, the football guys that they're, they're aligning things right uh, down in the desert in terms of some of the acquisitions, uh, you know, we've been able to get uh, the growth from some of the other younger players, even some of the, some of the older players, you know, uh, we're always continuously growing, we're always continuously getting better. Um, so we're capable for sure, without a doubt in my mind, of doing something special. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Um, I, I, I can't put a number on it. And I, again, I know that's cliche. I know that's probably not the answer you want to hear, but I, I think we can do something special for sure. All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some names. I don't want you to react to it, but I want you to uh, just listen to this: Malcolm Butler, mm-hmm. James Conner, AJ Green, Rodney Hudson, Colt McCoy, Matt Prater, JJ Watt, Brian Winters. Those are all guys you brought in this off season. Yeah, Mr. Kime and and the coaching staff have brought in. What now? Did you get all those guys to in mini camps? Did you guys have? Were you the guys? Yeah, we did. together for the offseason. Yeah, what's yeah. the vibe? What's the vibe inside the team when you bring that kind of talent into your football team? I think they knocked it out the park, man. In terms of because obviously the NFL to me is a league, is a talent driven league. Obviously, that's why you're always trying to get better. But when you can double down on the character of certain people, I think that takes it to a whole nother level. So not only did he bring, not only did you know. Our team bring in great players, obviously proven players, but they're tremendous people as well. Everybody gelled well. You, a lot of the guys, you'd be able to think that they were there for, they've been there for for years before. You know, with how easygoing they were, but also with how intense they approached their work. You know, so it is good to see that he that they were able to bring in hardworking players, motivated players, but on top of all of that, good people. Yep. Hey, all right. Now we're gonna give you some. Michael, come on out, and we're gonna. Give you some questions. We had some great questions from all around the world come in for okay. you. So okay. Michael's going to read them to you. Uh, he'll he'll tell you where the question comes from, and then we're going to let the let the viewers have a chance to get in the conversation with Chris Banjo. Hey, what, Chris? I I would love to be where Jeff is right now because it looks extremely sunny and. I'm about good. to say it's right over there. It looks <laughs> it looks good. Uh, there's there's three or four very good questions here. The first one's from the UK from. British Bird Gang, they're like the biggest fan group for the Cardinals in the UK. Um, and their question is this, can Chris Banjo play the banjo or any other instrument for that matter? 
<laughs> yeah, I would be surprised how often I get that question. And I feel ashamed every time I get it because I cannot play a banjo. I don't, I maybe held one maybe once or twice. And it's like, <laughs> how do you have a name like that and not know how to play it? You know, but I, I always tell myself I definitely will get to it one day. But I'm like, let me let me focus on this football thing first before I that's that that's way more complex than than playing football, I imagine. So <laughs> Um, the UK and Irish Packers group, so same, but just the Packers group are also saying as well. How did you view your time spent in Green Bay? And if you could compare your time in Green Bay and Arizona, uh, do you uh, have you got a preference? Or I'm presuming you're you're going to say that you enjoy them both equally in that sense. I do, but look, I, and I, I, I'm somewhat thankful that I'm not in Green Bay as a 31 year old because playing. <laughs> Playing a, a game in December, <laughs> Green Bay, that's that's a whole different nature when you're when you're 23, 24. So I don't want to know what that feels like at 31. And I feel like my bones might be a little bit different now. So but in Arizona, you're fortunate enough because it's too hot. We're fortunate enough to have an indoor stadium with grass. Even before I even I ever went to Arizona, I was like, man, that's my favorite place to play as an athlete because you can't beat that combination. You're in the AC and you're on grass. Some of, the, some of the old school players would say, you know, that's us being sob, but look, like, hey, I, I just make the most of what we got. So to, to be able to play on grass indoors, I feel like you can't beat that. Now, from an organization standpoint, Green Bay obviously is a pristine, world-class organization, and I, I'm grateful for my time there for sure. Uh, Arizona is the same as well. Obviously, Arizona, I don't think historically has been the same from a winning perspective as Green Bay. Uh, but head to toe, they're both organizations for sure. We have a couple more questions here as well. We got a question, Jeff, from Brazil, from Menino, who asks, what is it like to train and play with Buddha Baker? Uh, what's he like on a daily basis? Man, Buddha's di- look, that's another guy, Jeff, I'm saying is different. And, and it's crazy. Buddha is, when you think of an NFL player or an NFL safety, whatever case you may want to be, Buddha will not look like that in any way, shape, or form. And I mean that. I don't mean that disrespected by any means. Cause I don't myself. I mean, we're not the biggest guys by any means. But when I say Buddha has the biggest game that you will come across of, I'm talking about from any position. Like people always use the term somebody, you know, plays like a man possessed, or somebody, you know, with their head on fire or whatever. He legitimately looks like that wholeheartedly. And I've always heard that term. And this is the first time I've really felt like it's come to life. You know, uh, <laughs> Buddha, Buddha is, is, is fun to be around. He's probably the, one of, or if not the most competitive person on the team. Um, and his energy is contagious. It, you know, the way he, his play style is contagious. Uh, he's been one of my favorite players that I've come across to, to watch, uh, to be a teammate of and everything else that goes with it. So uh, Buddha's, is, is, and on top of all that, he's a really good person. So Buddha's cool. Buddha's my guy for sure. Uh, right. Last question coming up, but before that, Alexi from Finland also asked, could you play the banjo? And if not, why the hell not? We'll, we'll, we'll come back oh, to that I'm at some point. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> last, last question is from uh, Fred Flunk in Ireland. He says, what is the first thing you bought from your first pro paycheck? Man, first thing, what did I buy? What did I, I well, I don't remember what I bought. I do know, I still have a picture of it. The first thing I ever did, it's kind of a little ratchet too, but the first thing I ever did is I went and cashed my check because I just wanted to see it. To me, that was most, that was the biggest check I had ever seen in my life to even fathom something like that. Um, and I went to go cash it and I took it to the car and I sat in the car for like 30 seconds and then I started getting paranoid. So I went back and I went right back. But I, 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 just, just to be able to cash that, that that moment for me was 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 crazy. I can't remember what I bought. I don't, I don't think I did anything crazy right away because I, obviously I didn't get a signing bonus. You know, a lot of people get signing bonuses and they get that first check, you know, before training camp starts or whatever the case may have been. My first thing was right after, was after two weeks after the season had started, if I'm not mistaken. So when it hit, I was, I was focusing on football, but I'm like, let me take this time out real quick and just, I got to see it. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, like I said, it might be a little rash, but I, I had to, I had to see it. I had to see it for sure. I didn't Man. take, I didn't, Take the photo with the money to the ear, but I was tempted. I was. <laughs> you know what? I tell you, it's for me. It is so amazing to, you know, I, I, am I surprised by how the success you've had and what you've done? Not really, because you've always been that guy, and 
you've always done it the right way and you've always been uh, a guy that you know handles himself the way every NFL player should handle himself and you know now to see you with a wife and three beautiful kids and a nine-year career and you know and still going strong man I gotta tell you I love you and I'm proud as heck of you I appreciate it coach I really do that means a lot too man you if anybody knows the journey you definitely do so I appreciate everything genuinely man well well thank you very much for sharing your journey with all of our listeners and uh, and all yeah. the people because I think now when they watch you as an NFL player that they'll they'll get a different appreciation for what it's like to uh, struggle and, 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 you know, face that grind that you did and, okay. and came out the other end. No doubt, man. It's been a pleasure for sure, Coach. I appreciate it. All right, man. Take care, Chris. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Take care. And this is a little bit of a reunion show because we get a chance to reach out and say hello to a great friend of ours and great football coach and one of my favorite people in the whole world. Phoebe Schechter is coming to us from Pots Potsdam, Germany. Yeah, that's the one, absolutely. And I love that this is number 56. That was my first number I started playing in. <laughs> I mean, it's also very appropriate, especially we're gonna talk about some defense later too. Freaking awesome. <laughs> you know what, Phoebes, it's, it's funny because uh, last week we had Sebastian Vollmer on and it was the 55th show. And I said, okay, who was the best teammate you ever had that wore 55? And he said, he thought about it for about a, 10 seconds and he said, Junior say out. And I, he, he had a chance to play with Junior at the end of Junior's career. And he talked about what, what a big impact he was. So now I know that there's no other 56 in the world, but Phoebe Schechter, number 56. Hey, you've, you've, you've uh, gone international on us and you snuck behind German lines. How is it going over there? It is so cool. I have to say, like, I'm really close to Berlin and I'm out here. I'm so I'm assistant DC, and I'm also coaching linebackers. And it's honestly like been such a. It's been so cool because my players in my linebacker crew. I've got French, Polish, German, Swiss. I mean, it's like the United Nations just in our one our one group. So it's been really it's been really challenging in some ways because some of my guys don't speak any English. Uh, so finding yeah oh yeah finding ways to be able to translate to them what I want to get across has actually been a good challenge for me as a coach well it's a, it's good that you're such a great athlete because you're still at that stage where you can demonstrate for them so yeah. I saw that I saw classic 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 picture the other day uh, I think it was either on Instagram or Twitter I can't remember but it was you in the weight room and it was kind of like you're looking over your shoulder like this with kind of a disgusted look on your face and the weights are all the weights are all in front of you and it says the look on your face when the guy next to you is dropping the weights and making you know i don't know what what kind of noises you, yeah. you describe and i thought to myself what well, that's so that is so phoebe it is how, yeah and it's so typical of people in the gym it kills me <laughs> how okay now this is fun for me because when I was coaching in NFL Europe and I was working for the league and national player development, I loved to go out into the country and to the teams and watch them practice and meet the players. And cause what I found, and I don't know if you find the same thing, Phoebe, it's, I mean, obviously the language is different. The field, you don't have all the field equipment. There's all, there's some differences, but it's still football and it's still guys that love the game and it's still coaching and all those things. Do you find it the same way? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'd say the biggest difference is actually we have such a vast difference between some of our ones and our twos and our threes. But I mean, the guys are so passionate about the sport and I'm sure you experience this. Like you can't help but be around that energy when people want to be there. They want to get better. They're asking all these really great, great questions in their own ways. Like it's it's awesome because you get a you get to really see that development from start to finish. I mean, did you have a favorite place that you went to when you were over here? You know what? I, the, the, the favorite place I was in when I was over there was the place I was in. I mean, yeah. because it really, it really was like every place was unique. Every place was special. The kids were the players. I shouldn't call them kids, but the players, because <laughs> some of them, I mean, some of them are, you know, 
35 years old guys, you know, but the thing that was so amazing was, and I, and I thought it really, as an American who grew up in the game, playing the game, all that, I was a little bit embarrassed because here are these kids who like a helmet over there is stupid, crazy money and shoulder pads and all that. None of that is provided. The kids have to buy their own. They have to, you know, pay to play. They're practicing on typically on fields that aren't cut. There's no lines. There's this, there's that, you know, you really have to love football to play over there. And that's why I love the kids so much, because as you said, that it was just infectious, their love for the game. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, we're in, so we're semi-pro here. So pretty much half our players are imports and they get paid and the other half work a nine to five. And then they still come and put in all the time for, you know, zoom meetings at the moment or on field, like to see that passion and, and they're coming to practice knowing that they might not necessarily start or play in any games, but they just want to be a part of it. And that is yeah. such a cool feeling. Yeah, it really, really is. Now, you guys are 3-0. and You're tearing it up. Going to be Bundesliga champs, I guess. Like, <laughs> by the ring, size of the ring right now? or how, how, Yes, sir. <laughs> how's, how's it look coming at you, coming down the road? What's, what's next? Yeah, so we're playing um, Dresden Monarchs next, which is our upcoming weekend. And, you know, I think our first couple of games were a bit – easy for us, if I'm being honest. It allowed us to get a lot of people on the field. Our last game was a bit more of a challenge. We got to really see our guys play and our starters play. And I think we needed that confidence boost. I mean, we were confident in ourselves, but now going forward, it's like our goals are to be kings of the North, right? We we currently are at the top of the standings, but like winning the German Bowl is is definitely our, our long-term picture. And, and at the moment, like they're gelling, they're getting better every practice, the communication, you know, we've got all ages as well. So we've got 19 year olds through to, like you said, 35 year olds. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really good about ourselves. Our guys are going, especially on defense, we're going after the ball. Our offense is starting to come together. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting time right now. And I think if we can, we can beat the team this weekend, that's going to surely just set our trajectory for the rest of the season. Now I may be wrong on this, but didn't Dresden beat Braunschweig? last week and, yeah and that so was they, a huge upset because Braunschweig was has been the kingpin in the north division forever yeah definitely and Dresden are they're a good team you know they want to throw the ball they've got um a couple of studs on that on their team they've got a lot of options receiver wise and they've got a, a pretty pretty awesome middle linebacker playing for them too so you know without any doubt in our minds that that it's going to be a challenge but actually it's allowing us to play our defense this week you know we had to really scheme last week because one of the cool rules is you're only allowed two Americans on the field over here at the same time so you know for our other team for when we played the team last weekend they had two American receivers and happened to have a dual passport quarterback so we had to really be conscious of those two Americans all the time well actually now when you only have one American on the field that really narrows our focus and allows us just to worry about ourselves more than you know and kind of be on the offense in a way on the attack as opposed to waiting for what they're giving us. All right now, you you when you were with the Bills, you were coaching tight ends. Yeah. Right. And now you've transitioned over to the to the dark side. Yes, Has sir. that been a tough adjustment for you, or you feel more comfortable coaching defense? Um, you know, I think defense is a lot about emotion, uh, and and kind of really like getting that energy across. But I've actually, in some ways, I do kind of miss the offensive side of things. I love the the rules and the like thoughtfulness behind every play and. But, you know, they're almost like they're two different animals, as, as you know, you know, experiencing this yourself. But like, it's nice. I get to sit in the office. We've got Coach Feidinger here, who was with Tampa Bay and the Falcons for 11 years. So being able to listen to him and pick his brain and, you know, just just kind of the ability over here is that it's not like you only deal with defense. Actually, I can step in and I can get involved with some offensive stuff. Like I took tight ends a couple weeks ago to be more specialized with them. So I'm getting a little bit of taste of everything, but Actually, right now, like the defense is where my heart's at, and and I'm loving every minute, and I love the guys. <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell you something, girl. You better be careful because you're starting to sound like one of those guys like me, one of those coaching lifers. You'll be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Jeff, I'm telling you, I literally bought my first house. Right, I bought my first house, moved in like April 17th, and a week later, I was out here 
So I've not even lived in my own house. I'm just like, all right, more football, let's go. <laughs> you are you are a lifer, there's no question. Hey, no, I, um, I got I to gotta ask you about this because it's something I followed real close because we, we actually lost him as a guest on our show because of Ooh. what's going on. But you were around Cole Beasley on, in your time with Buffalo. And obviously, I'm very close to Cole. And, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and his his uh, toughness and talent and all that thing. But one of the things that's made him a great player is his self-belief and almost to the point of stubbornness that he can, yeah. <laughs> that he can do something. Well, that stubbornness kind of jumped up and, and got in a paper last week on his stance with uh, wanting to be unvaccinated, yeah. but not have to go through some of the protocols that they're, the NFL has done a really interesting job where they're quote, rewarding guys for being vaccinated, but it's more like you're penalizing guys for not being yeah. vaccinated. And Cole was adamant about that. And uh, I just wonder your take on that situation and how the, how you think the bills have handled it. Yeah. You know, I think it all, we always talk about that top down approach, right? So for me, it's looking at, okay, coach McDermott has got this kind of, rule per se, where you are, you know, we're within a fence and everyone has all the freedom to do what they want within this fence, but don't step out of that fence. And I think that kind of boundary idea is, is perhaps what's happened here with Cole. You know, I think everyone's allowed to have their opinion, right? But when you're at that level, that celebrity athlete level, you've got a platform to share that. And, you know, perhaps he might have overstepped the mark a little bit in terms of really letting the world know what he thought and uh, making sure that he was very clear about what he wanted. But like you said, you know, the NFL are, they're, they're pretty much making it a negative. If you do not have your test, you can pretty much do nothing on that list. And a lot of those things that are on that list are imperative to being an NFL player. So, you know, yes, have your opinions and, and I'm not one to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do. However, I think there has to be a little bit of awareness of it's not just you. You've got a bigger organization. You've got a bigger team around you. And, and sometimes it's looking at what, what do your teammates think or, or how is, how are my actions affecting those around me as well? You know, it's interesting. And, and again, like I say, I love him like a son and, and I respect very much his right to his own opinion. Um, but I also understand that there is a bigger game. There's a, you know, uh, and that's to get the game played safely on the field. Uh, we're going through a little bit of the same thing as we're starting now to to get ready for training camp and our return to play protocols and all of that. And, you know, what ta what Cole talked about has been picked up in the media here. And a number of the players in our league have felt the same way. Hey, I'm double vaccinated. You know, let me go without a mask. Let me eat with my other teammates. Let me do some of those other things. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's it's obviously, like I said, everybody's right to their own opinion. But when your employer says this is the way you got to be, you got a choice. You can either work or not work. And and uh, I think that's something we all face. Hey, um, tonight, obviously, not even not even very many hours from right now, there's going to be a, there's going to be a soccer game played in Wembley. Uh, <laughs> I got to ask you now, because you, you do you have any split loyalties here? Ooh. It's tough. It's funny. Our um, our GM earlier was wearing. Uh, he's already got his Deutschland shirt and his England shirt ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready to pull one off, depending on who's winning. But you know, it's uh, some of our like em our employees. You know, our, our film crew, things like that. They've already called in sick. They're saying, "Ooh, got a little cough. I got a little something." <laughs> the excuses are rolling in. But you know, we've got about like eight to ten Brits out here on the team. So there's I didn't definitely, know that. oh yeah. So it's definitely a, a divide that's been happening since the last game. So all I hear are the three lions coming home, pretty much playing throughout the office all day. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So now, are you guys going to watch it together as, as uh, English contingent? Well, so the interesting thing is uh, we do have practice tonight. So I'm hoping, oh, yeah, no. oh yeah, just add insult to injury. But uh, no, I, we're going to try and watch some of it together. But I think we're thinking whoever 
whoever wins, maybe they're the ones that get announced out the tunnel this weekend. We're trying to find some cool ways to get a little competition in here. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna ask you if you might have a little friend, friendly wager, a few, a few euros on this thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, we gotta have something going on here. You know, we, we, it's too much of a split in terms of obviously being in Germany. Like people are already celebrating, and over here, I have to say, they love their beer. So people have been drinking beer all throughout the day. The German flags are flying. As long as our players show up and they're sober, we're good to go. <laughs> hey, well, listen, girl, I'm going to let you go. And thank you so much for taking 15 minutes out of your day and spending time. I could talk to you all day. I'm really, really proud of what you're doing. Thank you uh, for helping grow this game and teaching these young guys that, that uh, you know, I, I, I I, I can't even imagine how big a thrill it is for these kids to, to have an opportunity to go on the field with you and your expertise and your background and your, you know, your experience and passing that forward with PB is really a cool thing. And I salute you. Thank you so much. And thank you for always sharing such wonderful stories. It's so great to catch up with you. And I can't wait to see you in person again. All right, girl, you take care. Thank you so you much. Too. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>